I got introduced to heroin as a 17 year old at Long Bay Prison by a perpetrator. It just made me completely numb and that's how I wanted to be. I didn't want to sell a thing. I'd had enough, I was beaten. I'd made peace with death. I was good to go, I would have done it. This is where the universe, God, call it whatever you will, intervened in my life. I was really grateful that I'm free. When I give gratitude and when I acknowledge what I've got, man, the next day it turns up tenfold. How many people in your life have got your back, have genuinely got your back? People that are failing in life, they have to project their vomit. For you to love yourself, if you're at peace with yourself, let's celebrate the fact that you love yourself. Let's celebrate because it's something to celebrate because you're at peace. When you know what trauma is, you can have empathy for the people who you've caused trauma to too. Vulnerability opens the gates to everything. You're never going to be stronger than you are in it. It's like a moment of vulnerability. Forget about how much you can squat or bench press. The real strength is in vulnerability. Russell Lancer, welcome to the Better Project podcast. It's a Friday morning. You've made the trip out here. Super grateful for you. And I think this is where I want to start this podcast because I know gratitude plays a massive part in your life. Mm -hmm. What are you most grateful for today? Right now, and what, just my freedom. I was driving out here, you know, it takes me an hour to get out here. But just that ability to go anywhere I want to go. Yeah. I think it's important to me. You know, I spent 23 years in prison, you know, and really tied down. Um, I, just, I, I jump in that car and I hit the button and there's this sort of a, like a smile comes on my face. It's like, yes, I can go anywhere I want to go. I'm not having someone fucking dictate the terms and where I can go and where I can't go. And I, I don't know, it's just a sense of freedom for me. That's just an, you know, and I get it when I jump on a plane, it doesn't matter if I'm going interstate or overseas, I get that same feeling. I really, I'm just really grateful that I'm free. Mm. And people don't know how lucky they are just to have their freedom. You know, people live in communist countries and that where they don't have no freedom or, or freedom of speech, which we're, we're rapidly getting, we're losing at the moment. But, um, just to be able to go wherever I want to go I, I and do what I want to do, you know. Having been the master of my own life, I love that. It wasn't always like that for you. No, it wasn't. And I'm very curious. I've got this photo here of this little 13-year-old version of you. Yeah, yeah. That's that. That's, 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 I, I remember the day this photo got taken. I remember, yeah, I remember that photo got taken. That's, um, yeah, I was living in Mount Drew, living in Lethbridge Park, you know. And you know what? And the the world, I didn't have a. I, I, when I think back, I don't think I had a care in the world back then. You know, mm. and no big. I wasn't a kid that had big plans or anything like that. I had a brother that was in the army, was big and muscly and that like that. But I was at this age where I started to notice things. I started to have an awareness of of people. I used to uh, of people's sadness and people's misery and and stuff like that. And I used to see the factory workers up at the bus stops of the morning, just fucking looking at them, smoking their hand, no smile, not smiling, and that. And then you know, be sitting out there, and some bloke just got out of jail, and he's being celebrated like a return war hero, walking up the street, and everyone's yelling out, and blokes are pushing their daughters out, saying, "That's the type of guy you marry." And he's happy and laughing and cracking jokes and looking fit and healthy, and um. And I thought, fuck, that bloke looks like he's having the time of his life. I don't know where he's been. I don't know what it's all about. But that's that's how I want to be. Was there any business people or other role models other than criminals that you could look up to? Or was it just, mm. that's just all you've seen? Because, you know, you came from a working class family. Mm. Yes, you didn't want to live that way. Mm. But they say, you know, personal excellence is the ultimate rebellion to any of that so yeah. if you wanted to grow, go create the life of your design mm. you'd go create a business and stuff like that sure. but coming from the area of mount Jewett, mm. especially back then was there any other i guess healthy role models to look up to or was it just mm. those those criminals you're like you know what i want that i'm going to go towards that look my brother my oldest brother was an electrician and he had his own business and that sort of stuff <clears throat> but not a lot there wasn't a lot because people from that area were really oppressed in them days. We'd never got, I think the area in itself stopped a, a lot of people from getting opportunities. I think, you know, if you worked in a factory and you were a foreman or a leading hand, everyone knew about it. It was like it was celebrating. Oh, John, John works in a factory. You know, he's the leading hand there and he might be able to get you a job when you get older or something like that. That's what, and I just, for me, I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be working in a factory. I just, 
and and and, and I no, I take my hat off to the people who do. I was just was I don't think I was ever built for that. I was never built for, you know, that sort of type of work. I always just knew I was I wanted to be a people person. You know, I wanted to be involved in people per. You know, and I used to see the bank robbers and, you know, two weeks after they got out, they're driving an SLR 5000, nice car, and the girls were all hanging off him. And, you know, and even <clears throat> I remember the early days of drug dealers. And, I mean, when I say drug dealers, people that were, you know, selling copious amounts of fucking pot, you know, marijuana. And um, I can remember them doing well too and, you know, driving Mercs. And, and, um, and I thought that looks, that just looked like a better life to me there the grind and the misery and jumping off a jumping on a bus and when it's dark and coming home when it's dark looked dark to me it looked miserable and i didn't want to live like that i wanted it i wanted that smile i wanted that happiness that these other blokes had did you have morals at that age to be like this is wrong to no, get into life of crime no no i didn't i didn't at all i didn't see any because I looked at, you know, I had, a, once again, I had awareness, like I'd go over these wealthy areas and I'd say, well, they say, well, wealthy and we're so poor. Why? And I'll tell you the thing I noticed, their parks, where their kids playground, we're nothing. Yeah. We go over there and theirs are all stacked with our ink. And I just go, why? That awareness is why are, are, are we less than these people? Why don't we have this stuff? Why don't we have the nice parks? Why don't we have the nice... Uh, tree-lined streets with shade on a hot day. Why don't we have that? You know what I mean? I used to see, I, from a young age, I seen the class difference. I noticed the class difference from some, say, going to St. Ives, you know, and you go to the park and it's got everything, like swings, and we get it. We had nothing. So, you know, what I thought, you know, I mean, and I've seen them people as thieves. I've seen them as, you know, I, I, I recall, you know, I, I used to think they're robbing us. We're not rubbing them. I, I honestly believe that from a young age. I thought they must be, you know, you know. I knew about taxes. I knew my parents. My dad was always whinging it. You know, Australia was so overtaxed, and I was thinking, why is he paying so much fucking tax and we're getting nothing? Because I knew about infrastructure. I knew, you know, my dad would tell me, you know, I've got to pay tax so we can have roads and we can have playgrounds. And I said, well, if I'm going playgrounds, we don't have any, you know, and we've got to pay for schools. Our schools were shit compared to, you know, the affluent areas, you know, and when I started getting into trouble, that's where I'd done all, all my crime over in the affluent areas. I thought I had that Robin Hood theory, I'll steal from the rich and take, you know, give it to the poor, and that's what I did. That pissed you off, you wanted to get get back at them because you felt like, yeah, they'll steal Yeah, I did, I, I did, I just, I just, I just, and you know what, and it was the first time, the first time I ever, like, it was I used to go, say to Miami Beach, and I'd have them people more you know, the eastern suburbs, and those people would hang shit on us from where we come from. You know, but there was nothing that a good punch in their mouth fucking didn't sort them out. Like, I remember some bloke saying you dropped a train ticket at um, the wharf at Manly once, and I punched him in the mouth, and that soon changed his attitude. And his mate was going off, and he's going, oh, he's so, his mate was going, he deserved that, he's such a dickhead, he's always trying to hang shit on people, and I do I just walked away, and I, I, can, I remember a few instances of girls turning their nose up at us. As soon as you say you're from Mount Drew, it was like you were some sort of leper, you know. And I'm, 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 you know, things have changed since. People are fucking telling lies that they're from there now because it's a fucking, it's a, you know, the emergence of Penrith Panthers and sportsmen and rappers and everything like that. It's a cool niche place to be from now. But it never always used to be that, you know. I learnt also from a young age where people would say, where are you from? I'd say, oh, out west Penrith area. Because Penrith didn't have that connotation that Mount Druid had. You know, that shamefulness. And the, I don't operate too well in shame. Well, as from a young, no kid operates well in shame. You know, I, <clears throat> I think it's a feeling that kids should, shouldn't have to carry. And that feeling of shame and guilt came from you a really young age from being in that boys' home, and correct me if I'm wrong, you were sexually abused there? Yeah, I went to Derek Boys' home, and Derek, it's funny, Derek Boys' home's just not far from here, really. I could run there in about 40 minutes, I reckon. Okay. And it's on the corner of the Northern Road and Richmond Road. It's still operating? or No, nah, no, nah, way gone. It's But the jail's there now. Oh, I don't know where that John is. Brady, yeah, John yeah. Brady Jail's there now, so yeah. But... um. 
Yeah, I went to Derrick Boys Home in 1984 as a 15-year-old, 15, turning 16. I think I might have my 16th birthday there. And um, there was prolific sexual and physical abuse that was taking place there. And unfortunately, you know, I didn't escape that. And, you know, it's I sat back and watched the 60 Minutes story about it a few years ago. And it wasn't until 60 Minutes got in, involved in it that anyone ever got charged. It was like 60 Minutes got involved in running the story there two days later five people that were sexual abusers out there got charged and i thought you know and still was sort of and i believe it was government sanctioned i also believe pedophile rings were running out of there because a lot of the sexual abusers that worked there that were were coming in there didn't work there you never see them they just turn up at the night time do their stuff and you never see them again you know what's going through your head when you know you're out in the streets and then you get put in this boy's home and then now someone's touching you. Like, what's mm. going through your head? What are you processing in that moment? Yeah, well, it's just, it's a void. It's a real hard one. Like, all I can say is it's like having an ulcer, uh, an ulcer in your stomach. Like, it's just a big, it's a big hole within you. It's just this emptiness. And it's, but in that emptiness is all these things, this shame and embarrassment and guilt and worthlessness going from in there that you just mean nothing. You don't count, you mean nothing. And these people can do anything they want to you. They're allowed to do anything that you don't mean a thing. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something, man, I'll tell you that. To have that, to be sort of, I wouldn't say, I, I don't like what it uses a normal, to be a little bit rounded as a kid and to have that thrown into you is, um, I don't know, it's just like, oh, I'm trying to explain how, trying to, trying to articulate it the best I can. So I just haven't, like, I can, something spinning it, like a spinning around in your brain, it's banging off the walls of your brain. It's like, bang, you know, it's banging off the walls of your brain and it's fucking affecting your vision, it's affecting everything and it's hurting your head. Your heart is hurting, it, and there's yeah, it's, it's a, and you're in complete utter darkness. You just can't process anything. No, you can't. That's and that spanner thing, spanner, because it is. It's stopping you from thinking. It's stopping you. All you know is you're in a world of pain, and you have got no labels because you know what they are. You're a kid. You don't know. You don't know that you're feeling depressed. You don't know that that you're you you're you're going for anxiety. You don't you know you don't know that you're. Yeah, you just don't know that you're living in trauma. It's because you don't know what trauma is. I didn't know what trauma is for many, many years. Joey Williams says it well that kids are not resilient. They form coping mechanisms to things like this that happen. Mm. What were some of your coping mechanisms? Um, my coping mechanisms was moving, keeping myself busy. I couldn't sit still. I just couldn't sit still. And... And joking, being a you know, being a fucking clown, just being a clown, humour, diversion, you know what I mean? If someone started to touch on something, I'd get them straight away from that. You know, I had a really good thing of distract and distraction, distracting them from talking like that, you know, and doing something stupid. And that was sort of like being Tourette, had like developing Tourette's is like, you know what I mean? Um Joey articulates trauma the best I've ever come across. Oh, it's great. Amazing. He's a mate, a good friend. Um, but, um, you know, and then, you know, coping mechanisms become drugs, become in particular heroin. You know, I got introduced to heroin as a 16, going on 17 year old at Long Break Prison by a perpetrator, you know. And when I, when I had that for the first time, it was, no, no, no. it was heaven on a stick. It was for oh, everything I've ever, like, everything I needed at that very moment. You know, to make me feel all right, you know, it just made me completely numb, and uh, yeah, it just made me completely numb. And that's how I wanted to be. I didn't want to feel a thing. How far did you think you were going to take it, or you was just taking uh, it day by day? I always lived on the precipice of death. I always did. I um, when I use drugs, and it's funny using with other fel heroin addicts. They go, mate. They say you use this stuff like you're on a different level how you're using it like people have a little shot and get stoned and when enough for me i have to be on a point of 
blanking out, you know, I had to be on the point of falling over, blanking out, about to overdose, like that's where I lived, that was my most comfortable place, knowing full well that this could go wrong at any moment. But you just didn't care? I didn't care, I had a death wish, you know, and I... You know, whether it was it'd been driving cars and the police chases, I'm like, I don't give a fuck, I don't give a fuck if I died. I just didn't care. Matt, what was that, that moment in your life where you're in this darkness, you're taking the heroin to escape reality, to mm. escape the truth? But I, I heard of you speak about it, that you there was a moment where you, you threw in the towel. And you started to win. You, things started to go right for you. What was that that shift? There's a few. There's a few that that led up to it. It was actually a, a bit of seed planting by a couple of people. One was a bloke called Greg Richards. He come in and done a Narcotics Anonymous meeting on a Saturday afternoon at Parramatta in 1987, and he he planted a seed in me. He goes, mate, there's gonna, and he was talking to a, a bunch of us, and he he said, you know. He said, you can have this life beyond your wildest dreams and you don't have to live in pain. You don't have to, you just got to follow this certain way. And I thought, oh shit. And then he talked about it. It never happened then. That the moment that I threw in the towel and, it, and, it's, and it, it's sort of, what happened was um, I was sitting in prison and um, I just got to prison. I just been pinched for robbing a bank at Coolangatta. And it was, um, and I was suicidal, you know. And I'd had enough. I was beaten. I'd made peace with death. I'd honestly made. Pe- I was good to go. I was, you know, I would have done it. And um, the co- what happened? I would. I went to a cell, and um, I just got there, and I would have needed a, a, a coaxial cable to hang myself. And um, the coaxial cable had been vandalized, so it was cut down. And it won't go around my neck. This is where the universe, God, call it whatever you will, intervene in my life. Um, I'm not a godly person by no means, but there was something just looking after me there. I felt its presence. And um, I had to put off knocking myself until the next day. And then um, a bloke who I suspected of being a sex offender and later confirmed he was, but denied it all the time, came up and offered me a shot of heroin. Like in a cell window, in the cell door, there's like a little display window where you can look in. And he said, uh, I'll give you this as a piece of remain you've never got on before. And I looked at him, I banged on the window and I said, no matter how bad I was feeling, I could never take anything from you. Bang, that put a spark in me. Because I stood for something. You know, I had some integrity, had some morals that I weren't going to take off someone or something. Like, no matter how bad I was feeling, that off a sex offender. I went out the unit. Um, there was a young bloke there studying. He had some books all spread out on the table. I said, what he studying? He said, I'm studying to be a psychologist. He said, um, and he looked me up and down. He goes, I took that advice off you all those years ago. And he looked me up and down with complete disdain and said, maybe you should take some of your own advice. And went back and just, you know. My mate came out. My mate was a lawyer. He come out and see me, and I said, "Mate, I'm fucked. I'm gonna get fucking ten, fifteen years." You know? He said, no, no. "He said I think I can get you a good result." He said, "We we we've got something up your sleeve." He said, "But you're gonna have to come up with an ace." He said, "You're gonna have to do something, whether it's causes or whatever." And then um, anyway, so that night I went back to my cell and because of who I am, the boys had all looked out. There's a TV in my cell, coaxial cable. There's a writing pad, some envelopes, some toiletries, and and some food. You know. So I sort of decked myself out for me. And I sat down on the bed and, you know, and I started to feel good, you know. Like, I, morally, I wouldn't take something. I'd done something with a kid's life that changed the trajectory of his life. I weren't going to get that long. And bang, flick on the TV, 7.30 report. And it, that's the Royal, and they're talking about the Royal Commissioning Institute for Response to the Child Sexual Abuse and how it goes down. But they're also going after George Pell, who... I just think is just a rot was just a rotten piece of shit, and I'll go on after Brian Houston, who I think also. And then it was like this. I knew what the Royal Commission was about. I'd heard about it, and I and I sat down. I looked at the writing pad. I looked at the Royal, and then so I wrote a page about the abuse that would have happened with the intentions, sending it to them, and um, and I put it in an envelope. And this is the phone in the towel moment. So I put it in an envelope. I went to the letterbox and I 
and they've got a letter box, a wooden letter box where you put your mail in, and then it goes out and gets posted. And I stood there and I was like, <laughs> and I stood there for 15 minutes and blokes were going, what are you doing? I said, fucking doing something. And bang, as soon as I dropped that letter in the letter box, it was the day I threw in the towel. Because that's when the healing began, because, you know, a couple of weeks later, Royal Commission called me out. They told me, they said, look, first thing they said to me is, we believe you, we know what happened to you. You know, because so many, not so many people, a couple of people I tried to report it told me I was lying. And that just left a stain on me to never trust people. And um, she said that. I, was, I asked her five times. I said, what did you say? She goes, Russell, we believe you. I said, I can't because there was a video link to like a Zoom call. I said, what did you say? And she told me, and then she sort of cottoned on. She goes, I'm just telling you. And she said it really loud. She goes, we believe you. So I've done this session with her, and at the end she goes, "Someone else wants to see." And I said, "I'm not talking to police if that's all, because I'm not going. I'm not going to be involved in talking. I don't trust them. They're the worst. Worst. I don't trust." And um, anyway, they said it was a trauma counsel, and I went and started talking to her. I was like, "Oh wow!" And that's what I first realised after you know a few sessions with her when she explained what trauma was. What I really realised what it was, what I had been going through, and and it, it's when I could put lay, start labelling things and identify a thought like you have a, a feeling, you don't know what it is, it's like, oh, it feels uncomfortable. Now I'll say, oh, that's anxiety. Oh, I'm feeling sad. Well, that's what sadness is. I'm feeling depressed, you know. That's what that's... And, and when you can label things and when you know what trauma is, you can have empathy for the people who you've caused trauma to too. But I didn't know it for a long time, so... I used to rob banks and think, for fuck, I thought, oh, I think I will get the payout there, sweet. There, nothing bother then, you know. And, um, and I used to think what I did wasn't that bad. But up until when I started to realise what trauma was, that's when I had general remorse, you know. And remorse isn't me saying sorry. I don't say sorry to people. Remorse is an action. It's not doing it again. Having an awareness of your actions, what, you, what your next move could possibly, how it could possibly affect someone. That's genuine remorse. And, you know, I get these fucking dickheads. They inbox me on social media and go, I was in the bank and you robbed it. You owe me an apology. I need you to say sorry or something. Say nothing. Yeah. And I don't say sorry to anyone because I don't, I don't fucking say sorry. That's just not a word I use. I don't believe in sorry. Sorry is a word. Remorse is an action. And sorry is actually an action. You know? so, but I've genuinely had a bloke who was a, you know, in a bank that I robbed and he contacted me and, and shout out to you, Steve. Man, I love you. Um, and he just, and he goes, mate, you owe me nothing. He goes, yeah, you traumatised me. And he goes, but, you know, and he said, I'm not going to, and that's, and, and he goes, but through your actions, he said, I get peace, you know, about what you do and how you go about things. I get a lot of peace out of that. And, um, and yeah, I, I don't understand people. What, 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 what's me saying sorry? How's that going to change things to you? It's not, it's not going to change a thing. How is it going to change anything? But by me not doing it again, that's what changes things. Oh, my be, uh, my patterns and my behaviour looks, you know, oh, yeah, he's not doing it. He generally is remorseful. He doesn't do that shit no more. You know, he works in a field of, of helping people. He gives more than he takes. That's generally, you know, I, I've got people on my social media following me and I, I, I know one or two, one, maybe there's a lady that's really positive, and I know she was in a bank. I never talked to her about it, but I remember seeing her name in a brief of evidence. And I know she's really, really positive, and I'm not, you know, if she ever says to me, oh, hey, look, I was in a, I'll talk to her. The one bloke who has contacted me, I mean, he talk on a regular basis, and he's really supportive of what I do, you know. So, you know, remorse, you know, all of these things I learned from my trauma counseling. I've done it for four years with the one woman. And I just learned so much about myself. But in saying that, I got so much peace out of it too. You know, I got so well, I got so much. You know, people. Like me, I've done a writing business. You know, but my greatest asset today is my peace. I don't have nightmares no more. I, you know, and and what I've learned to do through trauma counseling is love myself because love love is the antidote to trauma. That's the that's what well that's where you people you know, people don't 
you know, get cured from trauma by not. I don't even think you ever get cured from trauma, but they don't learn about their trauma. They don't handle their trauma by people hanging shit on them, saying you're this and you're a scumbag and you're, you know, real negative shit. It's hey, listen, you know, you're worthy. You're a good person. You've done bad things, but you're a good person. And I don't know. I'm just getting that self belief from my actions and being reflective too, of going back and getting joy out of helping other people heal through my experience. That's where my that's where the gold comes in my life. Mm. That moment that you mentioned earlier around that conversation where the lady said, "We believe you. Mm. It's not your fault." How does that make you feel in that moment when someone says that when the last 10 or so years mm. in yourself, 30 years, 30 years, 35 years yeah, yeah, in yourself, you were, you probably blamed yourself. You had a lot of shame. You had a mm. lot of guilt. And then for someone to come out and say, we believe you, it's not your fault. What is that rush of emotion that goes through? And what is your relationship with that little boy there? I'll tell you what it's like. I, I, it's like, Getting a piece of red hot steel, you got it in a furnace, and you're up in a fucking water. It's like, and all the heat comes out of you. And when I say heat, anger, frustration, like the shame and everything goes, and it just makes you just a piece of steel instead of a red hot piece of steel. It's angry, and will burn you, and you do all these nasty things if you touch it. I become this just a piece of steel. My heart, yeah. yeah. That's what it become. And, um, when I say that little boy there now, I, I, I just say the world is a beautiful place. The world is, and there's plenty of good memories ahead. And there's, it's not all, you know, those people that you thought were living this glorious life were in fucking a world of pain. They they are, they had facades on all that happiness that you see was all a facade because it's in particular two of them blokes I know felt sexually abused because they're now clients of mine. They used to walk past looking shit, driving nice cars because all that material stuff is a mask. Like I well, I know now I, you know I had some goals I've, I've I've achieved a lot of material goals I don't chase material goals for my happiness but one of my material goals. When I got out of prison this time, was to have an AMG, a C63 AMG Mercedes and a Rolex watch. Within three years of being out, I got it within a year. And it was the biggest anti-climax because I was chasing, I was chasing, you know, external, uh, you know, I was chasing external things for an internal reward, you know, and it wasn't an internal reward. But the internal reward I get today is the feedback I get from clients that I've helped begin the healing journey saying, hey, man, like, I get them all. I get it, saying, you know, people talking about inspirational stuff. And that, that's what I, that's my fuel. Well, I, I still like nice cars. I've got it. I've done well. I've done really well. I've got all that, all that, you know, again, you know, I'd rather drive the fucking nice car than the shit one. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's, that's just, and the way the taxation system is that I, you know, any anything like that. I've learned how to play that game too. So instead of paying a shitload of tax or rather just driving an Oscar, but that's all external. But the internal stuff I have today is I like who I am. I look at the mirror like the man I see. I love myself, you know. We've got that thing here in Australia, remember? Like, you know, our old mate loves himself. Fucking congratulations. Yeah. Fucking good on you, mate. You're in a good place. Let's celebrate the fact that you love yourself. Let's celebrate because it's something to celebrate because you're at peace. For you to love yourself, you're at peace with yourself. And I encourage people, man, do, you know, fucking, you know, go through it. Tick it, write things you like about yourself. Find them. Write things that you admire about yourself. Find what they are. And, you know, anyway, to just get in there and dig deep. Yeah, loving yourself is, is so important. It would have been a huge process for you to go through there would have been plenty of dark days where you're like, I don't even love myself. And how does that? How does someone get out of that? That's it's about transparency and it's about, you know, getting vulnerable. Vulnerability opens the gates to everything. Vulnerability, I think vulnerability and, man, you know, you know, I, was, you, all that, I never cried for years and, and, and crying and all that stuff out, but 
But vulnerability, being authentically you in that moment, being just saying, you know what, I feel like shit. I, you know, I'm fucking at war, I'm fucking pain. I've got all these things that I'm dealing with at the moment. I'm under the fucking pump, I'm under pressure. You know, I, I'm hurt or whatever. Like, folks kill themselves when they can't express themselves. I had a friend not far from here, Daniel Ching, who had a shootout with the police on, on High Street, a parent got shot dead. Just couldn't express himself, you know. He was in a world of fucking pain. He had an accident playing football for the Panthers. You know, his dream was stolen from him, you know, and he couldn't express it, you know. And he fucking pulled out again. Death by cop, suicide by cop, you know. So I that ability to express myself, the ability, firstly, what, what's in vulnerability, right? Mm-hmm. Why can't people be vulnerable? Because... They feel like they've got to trust someone to not, and, and, and there's a shame behind it. Well, what happens if they think I'm this? What happens? If I'm it's that fear of judgment. Yeah, yeah. What happens to that? And, you know, fucking, if they, if they judge you for being the strongest you can ever be, that's their weakness. Because you're going to be, by being vulnerable, that's the strongest you're, that's the point of strength. That's the strongest you ever be in your life. You're never going to be stronger than you are in that fucking moment of vulnerability. Forget about how much you can squat or bench press or anything like that. The real strength is in vulnerability. Definitely. And by you being vulnerable and sharing your truth, as you said, if people are going to put shit on that, that's just their insecurities coming up because they see you being vulnerable and they're like, oh, you know, I wish I could be like that, but Mm. there's something inside them that's stopping them. So... Mm. What they do is they try and put you down to make themselves feel better about themselves. Projection, yeah. Mm. That's that, the, the projection. I always found with people that are absolute, like people that are failing in life, they have to project their vomit. It's like, if I, I'll make, you know, Russell's doing really well. He's, he looks like he's happy. He's generally happy. He's fit. He's healthy. You know, if I turn around and go, oh, look at you, you don't do legs. Or, you know, or you got fake abs. And as they do like, for some reason, on my post, it's like, <laughs> did that make you? And often, you know, that that's that backfires on them, that stuff because they go, oh, fuck. I mean, because they don't play that game with me. Because, I mean, I'm an A grader when it comes to fucking verbal. And like, yeah, I mean, I, I spent 24 years in prison. I had prison officers hang shit on me all day. Yeah. And it became a game between us. And it was a game in the end. Like, the ones that, it was a friendly game with some of them. Some of them was a real nasty one. They were trying to anger shit on you. But when they realized they couldn't beat you, they wanted to be your friend. Yeah. Because they wanted to learn from you. But when they do that, oh, man, please, come at me. I'd rather them haters come at me than a 12-year-old girl that can't handle it and possibly could kill themselves. Yeah. You want to play that game, play with me. Definitely. Yeah. That shame and guilt we've been speaking a lot about, you say it doesn't belong to us. Mm. Yeah, a lot of men hold on to it. Mm. And they go down that dark path of eventually taking their own life, unfortunately. Why doesn't it belong to us? Well, often it's an action that's been perpetrated on us by someone, and it's an unwanted gift that a nasty person often gives us. Stay, you know what I mean? So when I tell, when I first tell my story, I give it back to them. It's like, it's like having a backpack, right? And it's full of bricks, and every brick had a label of it, shame, guilt, uh, horrible, anger. And, you know, and I start unpacking it. I start pelting it back in it. I visualise that. I'm right into visualisation. I visualise pulling a brick out, cleaning a piece of shit out there, you know, and hitting them in the head and watching them crumble like I did. I crumbled. And because um, it doesn't belong to you, because that horrible gift that someone, and often when they give us this, we take it. We don't go, you know, that, oh, mate. I'm, now all of a sudden someone tried, that's that, that's the whole projection of haters. When they try to hang that shit on there, it's like, stop sign, mate. Hey, fucking bounces back at them. Because I don't cop their shit. They can call me all these names and with the intent to hurt me. And they don't. It doesn't belong to me. And it doesn't, like, you know, people, constructive criti- well, criticism without a solution is a hate. You know, yeah, mate. You know, um, you know. I mean, these people. Like, that's that's how I see it. That's what haters are. They'll, they'll hate on you, say you this or that, and this or that. 
And I was like, okay, what's the solution? My client had this woman the other day saying to me, oh, what do you say about the people you're pointing the guns at, putting guns in their face? I was like, firstly, I just wanted to clarify something. I've never been accused of pointing guns at anyone's face, not in a brief of evidence or anything. I say, but... And then and she said, and I, and I said, so what do you suggest I say to these people that I didn't point the guns to the face? And I said, and what is the solution to helping these people that I didn't point the guns in their face? You know, because that's just what people want to do. People want to project and point and make you feel shame and guilt and everything like that. Because there's mostly a bit of shame and guilt going on in their life, you know. It's a real funny one. I had this bloke trying to hang shit on me. He hang shit on me a few posts. But in his profile, he's the happy family man and everything. Like, mm. I have a few working girls that support me. And she goes, Russell, that bloke, he's got these fucking pictures of his missus, family, loving wife and everything. She goes, he's at the brothel every Friday night. <laughs> You know what I mean? She and he and I and I, I just mentioned it to him. I said, "Do you know yeah, this little establishment that you go to on a Friday night? Bang, blocked. Never seen him again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that's how people are. Yeah. Because he's feeling guilty about that. There's part of him that's feeling shit about what he does, and he's and you know loving family and like so he has to project his nastiness. And I get it. I don't take that stuff personally. I no, don't take none of that personally. It's like, you should all chill and say, oh, man, good on you. You know, you're fake abs, sure. You don't do legs, okay. Is that what you got? <laughs> is that what you got? Is there, is there any, but what, let's, let's talk about you. Is there anything good you've got to say about yourself? Well, you can spin that back on them. They haven't got anything good to say about themselves because mm -hmm. that's where they're feeling like the failure. Oh, you know, when I say this, I say, man, have you ever seen me on the street? Come out to me, huh? second prize is black eyes, your call. You know what I mean? And I, I don't, and I don't mean that. I'll never punch someone on a paper just being a hater. I'm just like, you know, I understand that. I understand them people are in pain too. Having empathy for them. Yeah, yeah. They're in pain and it's like, okay. And punching them in the eyes. It just only amplifies the pain that they're in. You know, but um, I understand. I understand haters. Well, no, man, I was around prison officers for 23 years. They're the biggest haters you'll ever come across. And I used to do the Dr. Phil on them. You go, you go home, you treat me like shit. And I said, you go home, treat your kids like shit. But then you go home one day and the kids ain't there, the missus is gone. Because fucking all your fucking projection. Because you can't disassociate. You can't be this really nice, loving guy that fucking jumps on the lawn and hangs shit on everyone and just goes and fucking and be a real good dad to your kid. Because you're hanging shit on them as well. You're hating me, you're hating everything. You're not just hating on me. You think, you know, this law-abiding citizen, you know, that shop was a shoplifter when he was a kid, used to wag school, played up in your wife a couple of times, and the girl inboxes you a fucking nude photo, you're fucking sending dick pics to her, and then you're hanging shit on me. Yeah, yeah I understand that. You're not... I understand all that sort of people. I can't say I was ever a hater of other people. I was always a hater of myself. I didn't... But I never got into this fucking... Oh, I was always um, aware of not being mean to people because there was, my life was a contrast, you know, I was a bank robber and everything like that. I had that Robin Hood attitude. I said, you know, an interesting story. I went to a TikTok party. Um, TikTok. A TikTok party. party. Yeah, yeah, party. <laughs> anyway, all these TikTok employees party. And, uh, and this guy's got this $10, $15 million penthouse on Sydney Harbour. And he goes, what's your name? I said, Russell Lance. He goes, do you remember me? And I said, no. He goes, he used to go to Wayland shops. Wayland's is a suburb of Mount Dream. He goes, remember you were you're pulling up there in your flash car and he said, you open your glove box and call me over and give me all the five and ten dollar notes, you know. And he said, I'll never forget that. You know, and that bloke bought me this really expensive watch for Christmas. He said, I and he handed it to me. He goes, I'll never forget your generosity. It had a long lasting. This bloke's a sort of super duper wealthy businessman. He said, I just had a, a long lasting. Your your generosity made me kind. And guys, your your generosity was the first real act of generosity anyone ever gave me outside of my family. And guys, you made the world a better place you know, in the eyes of our ten year old kid. You know, that's part of and the watch is good too. So. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I love that. I love to, and I get to do that a lot these days. With look, I was really silly when I got out of jail. I was making really good money. 
people ring me up, I give them money, I don't do that no more, I don't give people money, it's just this thing I don't do. Like if someone rings me up and wants a hundred bucks, I've got really good networks for jobs and stuff like that. So I'm not going to give you a hundred, but I'm actually going to get you 300 for a day's work tomorrow if you're keen. Mm. So it's, you know, the old adage, you know, give a boy a fish he'll eat for a day, teach a man how to fish he'll eat for a lifetime, that's that. So I'm really big on that. I'm, I'm really big on not enabling people. I'm really big on creating solutions. I think it's important, you know, I think it's important. Like, if I point out a problem, I'm going to tell you a solution to go with it. If I don't, I'm a hater. Yeah. It's just like when someone wins the lotto, but if they have no skills on how to manage money or anything like that, they piss it all up against the wall. How many how many cases did you hear of that? How many times have you heard the worst thing that happened to me was when I was a lotto? I've heard a few of them. I've heard a few cases of that. People are saying, you know, that, um, and that's that whole thing. Yeah, it's that whole thing of not enabling people. I've got it with my kids. I have to cut them off at the same rate. Especially my oldest son, you know, yeah. Have to say, mate, you can't. You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to just give you copious amounts of money because you're not doing anything. You've got no work ethic. Mm-hmm. You know, and one of the best things you can teach your kids is work ethic. I think, you know, that's been the big difference between what I've done this time out. I've been, been out seven years in July. It's the longest I've ever been out of prison right now. And now um, is that work ethic? Just really. So I got out of jail and uh, I just, the goal was in jail. I'm going to work. Two years straight, every day, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and I have one day off in that two years. I, I, I set myself goals and chasing goals, and I achieved that goal with one day off. But I would have worked 16 hours a day on average most days, combining training and that sort of stuff. And I say that, you know, it kept me busy. And I love work. The work I do is not like work. It's like, you know, I'm interacting with people. I'm not, on, I'm not in the factory. And I'm not hanging shit on factory workers, man. God bless you, man. Um, but that's just not for me. I need to work with my mind. I need to, I need to interact with people, you know. And that's what stimulates me. I need to work. I, that's what I've, you know, I've found found something that stimulates me. That keeps me busy. Keeps me thinking, thinking, you know, strategy, creating strategies, creating and, and creating, I love creating solutions. Like you know, I get to do that in a lot of the work I do with survivors of institutional abuse because I can point out, like I say, this is the steps you're going to take. This is this is the roller coaster ride you're going to take. This is how it's going to go. It's going to go up and down like this. But this is how you're going to handle it, you know, and, when it, and this is what you're going to do. And creating that blueprint for survivors to be able to tell their story in a trauma-informed manner and feel supported and feel validated for the whole process, you know, you know, I was I had a, a client ring me last week and he was really upset with the lawyers and I just I was sitting with someone yesterday and they were they had the opportunity to see me in action, like how I deal with these lawyers. And I dictate terms with him. I say, Ah, you know, you know, you're treating my client with dignity respect. This client, this bloke had a commodity, this bloke's a survivor. He's been traumatized enough. You're gonna talk to him a certain manner or you're gonna lose fifty clients because 'cause I've got fifty clients stacked up at the moment. And you're going to lose 50 clients. Now you're going to talk to them, and and you're not going to rob him. You're not going to, and and that client comes back to me and goes, "That's the first time anyone's had my back. That's the first time I've ever felt supported. You know, and I was just so proud of you doing what you're doing because the clients hear what I'm talking about. Yeah. So you know, having people's back, and and I was thinking about, I just I just got a post ready as I was driving along in the car, and I was thinking about how many people in your life have got your back and genuinely got your back. Like, you know, I've had blokes come into my life and one bloke in particular not very really long ago. Just fucking, mate, they, they, they make out they got your back, but they're fucking haters. They're really, you can go so far that, and then once you go so far, you, you become a threat. You know, so... Having the right people around me is really important. And I, I, I like to spend a lot of time on my own. I like, I like, I enjoy my own company. I enjoy, I enjoy my own internal narrative. A conversation that goes in my head is not too bad. It never used to be. Yeah. You know, it was more like a Stephen King book. <laughs> you know, it was. It was a lot of fucking really nasty. And what was around the corner, there were strikes and scare. But today it's pretty cruisy. 
with everything that happened, did it have an impact on how you went into like relationships and intimacy? Because yeah. I know looking into this a bit, when someone's sexually assaulted, especially from a young age, they can go one or two ways. They can go hyper, like just everything's sex, 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 mm. or they just totally shut off to that. They don't, you know, look, I'll tell you what I, I struggle. I struggled for a long time with people touching me, mm. just touching me. Even, it doesn't matter, girl, you know. It, it is, prison's a real funny place, so you, know, you get locked in at, say, 2 o'clock at Long Bay, and blokes walking around hugging each other. You go, see them in the morning, because like they're, I don't know, they're, I guess a lot of them yearn that, but not me. And everyone knew not to touch me. Everyone would go, oh, Russ is not, go, man, it's not for me. I don't do that sort of shit. Um, intimacy and sexual intimacy is a whole different stuff. Like, I, um, yeah, I really learned about that. One girl taught me so much, so much what it was to really feel love in that moment. You know what I mean? It was, and I was one moment, I was like, fucking, she blew me away with it. It was the first time I ever felt purity. It was a beautiful feeling. It was just locked eyes and just talking, like communicating whilst in the act of it all, talking through communication was just amazing. And, um, and but how you treat women, like, you know, and be not objectifying women, I'm, I'm really big on how men treat women. I, I hate violence towards women. Fucking hate it. I fucking that's my pet. Men that hurt women are fucking cowards. You know, we've got legs, right? No matter like women are like button pushers. I know that. I've been around a fucking heap of them that just want to push button. We're right. Our legs are built for walking. We can walk away. It's simple, you know. And um, but that intimacy, you know, especially how you give and show love. You know, I give and show love through action. Action. I, I really want the best of that person. That person's in my heart. I feel them. If they're sad, I feel them. If they're happy, I feel them. I get joy out of their happiness. I get sadness out of their happiness. That intimate connection is that's that real. You're one. The heart becomes one. Like, you know, you feel everything together. I love that feeling. I love that feeling. You know, I've been with a girl on themselves. She'll like seven years. She's a barrister. Blokes like me pull barristers, but we only pull the ugly ones. I've got, I got, <laughs> got a good looking one. And, um, and, she ha and, and, and you talk about people that have your back. She's got my back. That's never fucking in doubt. Never in doubt. Like no one can say a bad word about me. She's so defensive about me. But she pushes me, that one. She really pushes me. You know, and we're from polar opposites. She's from a family of doctors. You have four doctors in it, mum and dad are doctors, emergency doctors, and and um, I'm just a scallywag from now until it. But she pushes me, and um, we own a beautiful farm up near Byron together, and that I am today what I am because of her. She is a seed plant, and she told me from the word go, I'll be doing what I'm doing today. She's like, she's fucking Nostradamus. She protected every move, everything along, along the way, and I don't know if she'll send a clairvoyant or what. I don't so much of what she predicted come true you know and um you know and about you know the notoriety i'll get out of it all too she goes you that's the bit you know you want to be ready for because that's a bit you might struggle with and she she knows that you know and because that's i'm getting to the point where people are making up stories in my life you know what i mean you know one bloke puts some post that i you had an altercation with a bloke at a service station. You locked yourself in the fucking car. Oh, that was shit. I go, I know, but my thing is, hey, let's run with that. That sounds good. Because, mm. you know, that's your imagination. You should consider writing non-fiction books. But just other things, you know what I mean? That that, that, that sort of stuff. Personal attacks and that never bothered me. But um, sometimes the imposter syndrome can kick in, you know, like sitting in boardrooms with people or on panels and stuff like that. Like corrective services. So I got called in to New South Wales corrective service on a panel how to give them advice to be better. It's like, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> You're asking me for advice. But yeah, I'm loving life, man. I, 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 and I, and I talk to people. I said, 
here's a little practice I do for, and you know, it's, it, it might be handy for someone, but you know, when I'm out of kilter, when I'm out of kilter, I just get, I go on my phone, put it on two minutes, stopwatch, count back. When I go this, and I go for everything, I move my foot, I'm grateful I can move my foot. Because, you know, and then I think of someone who's in a wheelchair that's got no feet, I picture that, I go, fuck, I'm glad I can move. I can, glad I can breathe freely, because from a young age, my dad had emphysema, and I used to see the horror in his eyes when he couldn't get a breath when he's choking. So I'm glad I can breathe, I'm glad I can see, I'm glad I can hear. And I'm glad I got some, you know, and I just go through all these little things for two minutes that I'm grateful for, and I'm bang, I'm realigned. Off we go. Day ends up being great. Just something I do. I haven't had to do it for a while, but I, I, I still do it. Coming back to the, the relationship piece, you said it's been on and off for seven years. Is that because you're going through this own journey? Do you feel like you're worthy of a, like a strong long-term relationship? I do, but... I'm so obsessed about doing what I'm doing. Like, and it's like, when you're in a relationship, they want to sit down and have dinner. Mm. They want to talk. They want to find out how your day is. Oh, fuck, I'm too busy for that shit. Yeah, okay. I'm selfish. I'm being selfish. I'm chasing a dream. I'm chasing goals. Or I want nothing to get in the way. That's like, fuck, man, the worst thing I can do is like, I'm like, I'll go to Dillman for a steak with my mate last night. I was in there. 35 minutes, I had to get out on a really good steak job. And I'll eat like I'm in prison. It's like, ah, here we go. I like it. And he said, do you, do you get to enjoy meals? And I said, sometimes you get that was like a $100 steak. He goes, you didn't want to be there. I said, yeah, because I've got other things going on. I've got to talk with this person. I'll talk with that person. So, and it's funny, you know, I'm really good friends with Mark Burris and, um, and we talk, me and him have talked about it on a lot of occasions. What's the biggest sacrifice your success, and he says business. And he said, you know, our relationships. He said, biggest sacrifice for my success in business has been relationships. He go, I can't keep them. He said, I'm too busy for them. You can't give a part of what they need. They need time, and they need presence. You could give them time without presence because your mind's elsewhere, and it's fucking pointless. Yeah. So they're the two things you got to give in relationships, and a lot of times they've got to give. Yeah. Do you feel like you make enough for lost time being in, in jail all that yeah, for those years? I think so. I think so. I'm chasing this dream, you know. I like ticking things off, like, you know, I like ticking off little goals. But another thing I don't do is I don't take time to appreciate the goal I achieved. Tick it off now. It's like fucking black days, fucking sign, mouth drew or pen. You see them, but you don't get to stop and see where you are mm. and appreciate where you are. It's like bang, 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 next one, next one, blue metal, lift go, my G, all that girl form. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then one day you look behind you and got all this stuff, you know. Like I do now, like, you know, I look better. But, um, yeah, relationships, are, man, if I can, I'm not good at them. I'll give you relationship advice, though. <laughs> it will sound good. It will sound good, and you apply it to your life and it will work. Because I'm, you know, you know, I'm very observant and I see what works for other people, but I'm not good at doing them. You speak about this dream of yours that you're chasing right now. What is it? And do you feel like when you achieve it, will you actually stop the smell of the roses or will you just think of something bigger to get after? The dream is to create an awareness for survivors and, and really shut down fucking pedophiles. To really shut them down to the point because now yeah, we're, we're fighting a losing battle. The, you know, we, we've fucking, in terminologies, you know, child inclined perpetrator or child, some of these things that are opening up for these people. Credit awareness, educating parents, you know, educating parents of how to limit kids getting into trouble. You know, there's, there's certain things that I, I, I'm, I like, I'm research, I research stats, you know, for. You don't need your kid to get in trouble if you're involved in a couple of things. If your kid's involved with a little athletic swimming at a team sport and you're at every fucking training session in every event, there's a fucking like 60% chance your kid never get in trouble. That's stuff. Educating kid, uh, people about being, and uh, uh, pa families about keeping their kids out of trouble, that's a really good way to do it. But educating single mothers, the red flags, because 
single mothers are tar targets for pedophile, educating people who run schools and everything like that. Like, because we've got a, you know, we we get a private private school and they are known for perpetrator. And I've got this platform that I've, got a, I've got created for you. You can do it in a really good, safe manner. And you're going to have a really good, safe and supported manner. Um, so that's a big goal of mine. And, um, you know, and just being a part of that change, you know, being a big part of that change. Will I stop? I'll stop when I start hearing fucking perpetrators getting 25, 30 year jail sentences or never to be released. That's when I'll stop. When, I, when, 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 when that becomes a common, a norm, I'll stop. I'll say, okay, don't know, Joe. But it's not going to happen in a hurry. You know, when these courts are fucking smashing them, when I'm in conferences with judges and, and explaining all why they should be smashing these people and the damage that these perpetrators cause, they create the next... That that guy that's got a propensity for violence, let's peel back the onions, let's find out, let's rewind, let's find what, what, what happened to you. And Joey talks about a book by Dr. Bruce Perry and, and Oprah Winfrey. It says, what happened to you? It's a simple question. What happened to you? Let's ask these people, what happened to you and how can we help? What can we do to deal with your trauma? And, and these are the resources we, we, we can apply to you. It's not going to work for everyone, but we're fucking working a lot. I'm curious. Do you have any sort of empathy towards the perpetrators? Because obviously... Well, Kids are born innocent, right? Mm. Something's happened to them for them to turn out that way. Do you have any sort of empathy no, towards them? Not a bit. Not a bit because it happened to me. I didn't do it. Yeah. And I, I just want to dispel this bullshit fucking stat. They say 75% of perpetrators were fucking victims themselves. It's bullshit. It's a lie. It's fucking bull. I've got maybe 30 mates that have been sexually abused, 30 people. I, I, but I've got, man, I've got a bigger stat than that. None of us are perpetrators. I've got 18,000 clients. Not one of them are perpetrators. Not one of them has been convicted of a sexual offense. It's bullshit. That's a lie. That's a fucking lie that they create. That's a stat that they create. That's a stat that, you know, it's never been, it's never been proven. It's, that stat has never been proven. Someone's made that fucking stat up. I'll, I'll, I'll say, we say to the universe, universities, now, we've got all this data. Do you want to want to work with us? They don't want to work with us because that's the one stat of this spell. That's that one stat of this spell. Because, you know, I'll tell you about pedophiles. Pedo and, and, and people don't understand. In the court system, right, people go, why are they treated so lightly? And I'll tell you why. It's a simple explanation. They keep the fucking chains of the fucking justice system turning. They create the next person with propensity for violence that's going to be going through the court system. They create the next drug addict that's going to be stealing to get money for the drugs and keeping the court. They, they turn it over. It's a stimulus. It's a stimulus. They, they, why would they wake them? Why would they put them out of it? Imagine that. So they talk about a perpetrator has normally done 15, uh, abused 15 people before they get caught. Imagine if every time one went up and we just started whacking up. No, nah, mate. You either get fucking your balls cut off and then and, and take chemical and stuff that you fucking stop you, or you just spend the rest of your life in fucking jail. All of a sudden, we got, we take this trauma out of society, like we make it safer for children. I was driving out through a country town the other day and I went, bang, it was the first time I've seen kids riding around on skateboards and out on their own. From how nice is this to these kids can be safe? You can't do it in the city because some of them, you know, they create so much danger and they quote, create so much fear and trauma. Imagine we get rid of that, you know what I mean? Because kids thrive, you know, when they don't have to live in fear. Mm. Their kids walk up the street, you know, they can't. They, like, as a male, you see, you know, I look at tattoos and stuff like that, and you see, see, they look at you sometimes, all oh, right, is this a bad man? You know, you know, I, um, we've got an emphasis on this country. We've got all these resources available to go after bikies. And then I'll give you an example. In Queensland, they've got Task Force Maxima's got 120, they chase bikies, 120 coppers. 
task force or Argos at one stage got 15. So the government in Queensland in particular, which is fucking, Queensland's a pedophile's paradise. I fucking know how they get treated up there. Yours has been good people, but the judicial system and, and the government up there are really protective. So the message that Queensland government say, bikies pose a bigger threat than pedophiles. But pedophiles must be created half the bikies for validation reasons and safety. It's crazy, huh? And I love educating people on this. And people, I want people to say why. I want them to say why. At next election, why? Why is that? You know why? That 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 premier. That there's a bloke down in South Australia says I'm going to fucking lock them all up for life. You run a political campaign based on that. You, I'm telling you, you should be able to fucking knock it out of the park. The only problem is, pedophiles are rich too. There's a lot of rich pedophiles. That had donated, and on that last LNP government, I'm sorry, man, I'm telling you, that was the dodgiest thing I've ever seen in my life. You know, that Scott Morrison, oh, man, like, yeah, and, you know, Hillsong Church, and oh, I don't ever seen it. That, that, that was a protection. They, three, two former prime ministers and an opposition leader went to George Pearl's funeral. Let's, let's, let's say George Pearl was not guilty. Right, let's talk about it. But there's a thing called the Melbourne response. He wrote it. He was the architect of it. So what it is, it's a blueprint for how to move around pedophile priests and how to pay off. So how to get them avoid help them avoid detection and how to pay off, you know, victims when they when they when they come to light. So that's accessory after the fact, as far as I'm concerned, before and after so we show on this is this is what you do if you do get caught, and this is how you go about it, you know, once you become... That's... Well, why would you celebrate that? Why would two former... Pro- and, 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 and it's known. It was brought out... He admits it at the Royal Commission. Yes, he did write it. And his, name's, his name's on document. So when you've got two pri- former prime ministers and a, you know, acting opposition leader celebrating the life of a man that will cause that much harm to children... Man, where were we? Wait, where are we at? Shows how fuck society is, eh? It does. You know, and I've had blokes wanting to fight me, like about doing posts. Blokes inboxing me, going, "You hate Catholics? I don't hate Catholics. I hate pedophiles." Good luck to you, beat me. Pray to you whatever you want. You know, pray to whatever you want. And one bloke, uh, Mick Gatto, is a good friend of me, and and, and uh, they said. I bet you Russell won't bag Catholics to Mick. And I said, no, no, Mick hates pedophiles as much as I do. That's why we're good friends. He supports me because he had, if a priest is a pa- pedophile, he'd hate him as much as I do, or maybe more, because he would shock me and he can shoot a girl. Yeah. He don't miss. But um, I mean, it's not about religions or anything like that. It's about the people who operate in it. Man, whether you, I don't, you know, I was in prison for 23 years. That's six fights in 23 years. Because I'm not a bully, I don't, and I respect people. I respect your religion. You grow, if your religion's working for you, not hurting children or anything, you know, you know, let's go. I'm your friend. I respect yeah. you. I just hate when people use religion as an excuse to do shit like this and then try and cover it yeah. up. It's, it's disgusting. Ten Hail Marys and you forgive it. I don't yeah. want. I read the Bible three or four times, and I just didn't make sense of it. I didn't make sense of it. But a lot of people do, and good luck to them. That brings peace in your life. Good luck to you. You know, I'm I respect everyone's religion, everyone's belief, everyone's culture. That's what my life is. It's about respecting people. What do you believe? Do you believe there's a higher power? I yeah. I believe in universal. You know, you know, I feel it at times. I just feel. I just you know because when I give gratitude and when I acknowledge what I've got, man, the next day it turns up tenfold. You know. And I just I know that there's someone looking down, whether it's my dad or whatever it is. There's something wanting me to do well. There's something doing me because you know I've done a lot of bad, you know. But there's something, you know. There's in in law there's a word called ameliorate. It means to balance out. It means to you know, I've done a lot of bad, but I'm balancing out with good, you know. And um, it's been my life, you know. Talk to me about. The relationship you have with your two boys it's bailey and kai correct yeah bailey and kai it's been tough going you know, because i've been absent for a long time and um you know uh, there was a lot of things when my kids were born like 
when when she was pregnant, I um I was living on the Gold Coast, and I was one of my kids because coming from here, we used to go to Calabudra for our holidays. We used to go to Gold Coast. I was one of my kids to go up around. So met this girl. We bought a house at Karama, not far from Calabudra, where I used to go on holidays. And I thought this is it, and, you know. And for me, the underlying issue of my abuse was never, and it was like I was clean and sober for a long time, and it was never addressed. And um, I was, I've just kept on the bandage. Long story short, I started drinking, started getting on the drugs, and ended up back on a trajectory of crime and, and that sort of and drug use again. Which I went away. Kai was three when I started getting back into trouble, and Bailey was one when we come distant. And you know, and um, with the benefit of hindsight, how selfish it was, but I didn't know any different. You know, I, I'm I'm my father's. I'm my, I'm the father of my, my father, beautiful man, but he was distant. You know, I grew up from a young age. I was talking about it yesterday. I could cook at five. I could iron at five. I was self-reliant. You know, I um, my parents were both factory workers, and um, and I never used to see him. So you know, I didn't have a lot of guidance. I didn't know how to be a dad. I never, and I, I recognise that now. I didn't know. You know, I had a lot of things, you know, I, I, I used to say to my partner, we'll never hit these kids. These kids will, will never live in fear. She had a different take on She liked whacking them. And, you know, and then and then um, I was in jail and um, she ended up in a relationship with our head, had the kid's hairdresser. And, um, and he was hell-bent on me having no contact on my kid, you know. And, um, he was hell bent on, you know, at one stage my kids were going under to school under his name, which is Fallon. And um, really got to me that so I, I was meant to get to me. He's just a bit of a nasty piece of work and it was meant to get to me. And, and then and Kai was 13 and, and I got a letter, I got a message from a woman who said, oh, look, Kai's been punched up by his stepdad. It was pretty bad. And um, she took him to the police and, you know, and the police were aware of who I was, and they sort of brushed him off. They said, "Ah, oh, you're just trying to be like your dad, and you know, he's, just, he's a good bloke, just trying to teach you a lesson." So I sent him to my mates around to give him the fucking wake up call. Him an offer he couldn't refuse. He got kicked out of home, and you know, I'm reading these fucking reports, child safety reports about him sleeping in. Oh, it's killing me, and I, you know, I made a big decision. That was a big part of the decision. I'm never going to get in trouble. Put them in a position like that, you know. So I got out after four years. I haven't seen my kids for four years, and flew Kai down. And it's been it's been a battle. It's been tough going. It's been the biggest toughest part of my life because I tried being their mates, you know. And that's that's another, you know, you you, you got to be the dad. You got to be the one that gives them the discipline and structure. You got to one that one that sets their boundaries. And I had like you know, I was like, I got, what do you want, mate? I'll buy you whatever you want. I tried buying them, and you know, and it backfired on me because then they started ganging up on me. They'd realise if they leave the dishes stacked, I'd give them a hundred bucks to wash the dishes, you know what I mean? And stuff like that. So, um, but it's gotten better, you know. And he said to me recently, that especially Kai said, I wish you would have built me when I was young. I might have taught me something. I said, I would have taught you fear. But I never want you to fear me. You know what I mean? You know, you can, through kids, the word, hey man, I'm disappointed, could have a much bigger impact on them than a fucking smack in the ass. Hey, I'm fucking disappointed you've done that. I've realised that. I've realised, claim that expectation. Hey, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of what you're doing, man. Like, I ring him up, he's working, working as a roofer. So I'm proud of the youngest one, I've got to get a DNA test. He's too responsible to be <laughs> He's just too responsible. He's so fucking responsible, that kid. It's like, He's so risk averse, you know. Like he doesn't want to be anything like his brother. You know, he doesn't want to be anything like me. Like the the business side of me, he'll ring me and ask me for advice. He'll say, "What do you think of this? What do you think of that?" You know. And, but um, you know, he's um, he's twenty years old. He got his excavator. He'll buy his first house at twenty five. He's that kid, you know. He's so responsible. You know, you you you're smoking heaps of pipe now. He's not, and you know. You now he's well grounded. Like I, I've, there's there's a lot of guilt around my kids. You know what I mean? There's a lot of there's a lot of guilt because you know, and Kai was very involved in the criminal behaviour, and, and I 
I'm going to say, hey, mate, don't do that. That's always what you did. Why don't, why don't they come back? But I do say this. I did do it. I spent 23 years in jail and it wasn't worth it. That's the only thing that got on me. Mm. Yeah, there, there would have been a lot of hurt inside knowing that you weren't able to lead by example for them and show them, I guess, the right path to go down. And still to this day, you're still trying to build a strong relationship. Yeah. Um, do you feel like that's going to happen? Yeah, they're coming in the manhood now, you know. I think what's going to happen is we're going to be the grandfather. We're going to be the grandfather father that they never had. I can relate to that in the terms of my own dad. I never had the best relationship with my dad. Mm. As soon as my daughter was born, I was like, who is this man? Mm. Like, he was a totally different like granddad, dad, to then what I experienced growing up. Mm. And I definitely feel that's going to happen to you. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of men go through that. It, it's mm. like, in a way, they're making up for what they didn't do with their own mm. kids. So they're going to do that with their grandkids. Yeah, I think that's how it'll turn out. Because, you know, they're, they're men now. They've established their ways of life, you know. And like Kai, he ring, he'll ring me all the time. Normally, he's trying to sneak me for money. But, um, B... That's the importance of time and presence, I think, is like, let's see how to turn my phone off. You know, turn my phone off, let's talk, what are we talking about? Let's hang out, you know? And for him now, we'll go out, we'll go, like he comes to Sydney, all right, sort of my social media presence and sort of stuff like that. Or I'll be on the, I'll do on the live with Cursor hmm. on Instagram. He thinks that's the coolest thing ever and his mates ring up the old dad's this or that um, he loves that but he loves time he, that's what he says to me I just love it when we can hang out you know and we can just talk and go for walks and whatever and we do that we go for well he'll come down this weekend stay with me for a couple of weeks by the end of the travel weeks and great he's going <laughs> I'm fucking but um but I understand because he's got his own trauma you know he he's got especially Kai he's got his own trauma from that stepdad you know I'm glad he's at an age now with that stepdad. Like he's that stepdad's got a bit of fear back now because he knows Kai can, he's gonna fucking fight that kid. He's yeah, fucking something special. And um, you know, it's, that uh, he never has to live in that fear again. And he said that about me. And he said to me, you know, about me. He goes, I, 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 I can't ever recall you ever hitting me. I said, no. I never would. But um. And that's, once again, he says, you shouldn't have forgiven. He says, I oh, fucking deserve it, you know. And I love that accountability about this kid. Like, he's got a pretty good awareness, too. He's really smart. He's a really smart kid on about awareness. I think um, he's got some behavioural problems, that, you know, that stem from the trauma of that intergenerational stuff that I brought into the family, and that's the part. When I see it in play, I just go, fuck, you know. Just watching the movie of me playing out. It's not... Hurtful for me, it's hurtful. I, it's I just don't like seeing that pain in him. There, there was another thing, you know, in the whole scenario it was like when she, the mother, kept him away from me for all them years. I said, you know, one day these kids are going to hate on her, and the time come when they did, and it was fucking the biggest anti climax because seeing my kids in so much pain for them to have a hate on their mother give me no satisfaction. I thought it would. I thought I was going to be so good. Like, don't they fucking hate on you? And, and I didn't. It just fucking didn't. It didn't feel good at all. Yeah. That's why I, I dislike so much when relationships break up and they use the kids against the mum or yeah. the dad. It's like, at the end of the day, you're doing it out of spite. Yeah. yeah. But all it's doing is hurting the kids. Mm. Now and in the long run. You know, yeah. People don't see that. 100%. A hundred percent. Like, you know, you know, um, I used to ring from jail and then kids wouldn't talk to me because the stepdad would be in the background while I was in the whole phone call. She's got nothing to do with him. You know, and and some of the I think she regrets some of the decisions she made because she just tried filling their heads up with doubt about he's gonna get out, he's gonna do this, and I'd done totally the opposite. And I made her just look like a fucking idiot. You know. And um you know, I teach my kids about kindness and everything like that, especially money. I said, don't let money dictate. And she's all about holding on to every cent. 
and I'm not like that. And I said, you'll always be okay in life if you give more than you take. You know, she wouldn't fucking, she would just take, take, take. You know, there's some real good things I've installed in her kids and I see it in them. But, um, yeah, it's fucking sad. It's really sad when they're hating on their mother. And he, he's just caught, the oldest one's got no relationship with her at all. He just wants nothing to do with her. You know? What are some of the lessons that you want to pass down to them that you haven't already? Well, well, the oldest one is um, hard to get through in that, that, that hard work, no shortcuts. You know, there's no, any shortcut over talk in life end up being fucking costing me. You know, end up being, being the long way around and, there's no shortcuts in life, and, and fucking love yourself. You know, you're fucking beautiful. You're beautiful. You're beautiful in your purest form. You're beautiful, and and believe in yourself. Believe in because I see him, especially both of them. have got a bit. I see a little bit of self doubt. I say, fuck, fuck that doubt off, man. It's taking you nowhere. You know, it's taking you nowhere. Just yeah, really. That that's that self belief, man. You know. It's funny, I'm, I'm friends with a bloke who's a big club owner. And he, he, Eric Drury's not a big shout and one of the best blokes you'll ever come across in your life. And um, I, I talked to his nephew, I'm like, he's a really good kid. I love that belief. I love his self belief. He's about 22. And I remember I'm not telling him that self belief. It's going to take you so far. It's day of the fate, day of the fate, day of the doubt, you know. That's another killer of dreams, you know. You know, and I say that, you know, the, 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 the what is it? Oh, what is it? The doubt, you know, let the doubt of others be the fuel to your success, you know. And doubt me at your own peril, because I might make you look like an idiot, you know. Well, there's a chance I will. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Russ, we have a closing tradition on the podcast where the previous guest leaves a question for the next guest without knowing who it is. So the question for you is, is it important to be respected or loved by others in life? Uh, I think there's a bait. I really think love and respect are the same thing. How so? I think there's the, there's the they line up, you know, you for me, if I respect myself, I love myself, you know, because I, re- I love myself to know, to know that I deserve respect. Mm. You know? Yeah, I, c- I can definitely feel that that self-love, that, that inner peace that you, you now have with yourself and yeah. that drive and that purpose to achieve anything that you want to achieve, especially around what you're doing now. With the business, what's it called again? Warriors Advocacy. Warriors Advocacy. Yeah. You're definitely going to get there, man. Yeah, I'm getting there. I'm loving it. I'm loving the journey. It's such a beautiful ride. You know, it's such a beautiful... The view is amazing. You know, I'll drive out in some of the most beautiful countries. I'm driving to Tamworth tomorrow. Like, I'm a Dale tomorrow. I just get up there. Barrington Tops, it's just God's country. But that's very similar to my life. The view I see, I'm going to drive... I'm going to go for a drive from here and go past my old house. And I'm going to drive before I go back in the city. And I love it. I even want to say it's an old housing commission. It's a beautiful view. Mm. It's a beautiful view. It's, uh, it's where I grew up, you know. It's where I'm basically born. It's where I uh, learn how to walk. That's a beautiful view. What feelings and emotions come up for you when you do go into Mount Druid and your old house and your old house? Yeah, it's a real warm feeling because the yeah. people, I feel the people. I feel the vibe. It's, I just feel the, the vibe and, you know, I get a lot of... A lot of the Mount Druid people really support me. You know, they really got my back. Whether it was in jail or out of jail, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I feel at home. I always feel at home coming back there. I'll never live there ever again. <laughs> never. It's never live there again, but I feel at home. Yeah. Mm. Russ, thank you so much, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.